term will be used. And it won't be until later on that it'll be explained. And when we're talking about inclusion and safety, this all ties in, so. I that love that. I and I regret only that I forgot to turn the recorder on immediately upon starting the yak shaving conversation. I was going to change my t-shirt until you uh, turned the recording on. I have a t-shirt that I just delight in, but I can't wear it uh, in many places. And it is F something company. Uh, with an ED fast, at the end? Yes. The end. <clears throat> yes. Instead of fast company, it's something else company i think this is an adult show you could say the whole phrase you got it it was a website back in the day right fucked company was a website yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, it was it a well-respected news organization uh so here um pud kaplan that seems like a really interesting thing yeah. But it, it was basically a death watch uh, for failed companies. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. And it was a parody news service. And it was a parody of Fast Company, of course. But uh, I don't know what I, that was the dot com bust. He also did Blippy and Tweet Name and Flirt 140. So he was clearly on the high road. On a, on a, on a, on a slightly more elevated but equally rude note, there's, uh, there's uh, fuck up nights. Yes. Okay. Um, it's well, a phenomenon, a phenomenon out of Europe where people come together in large halls and talk about their fuck ups. I first encountered it in Vienna, where the mayor of Vienna, bless her heart, stood on stage under a huge sign that said fuck up nights and talked about failures, which is something you could never imagine an American politician doing. For so just well, they do it every day. Just for grins. Uh, here it is. No. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. Um, and I will actually connect that to uh, the word euphemism we're avoiding using, sort of. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so there's Fucker. a whole, .com. Okay. whole bunch of terms here. Exactly. So some new and websites then, to check out. And then this is interesting. So Ai Weiwei named his site Fakke in Pinyin, which I'm brutally mispronouncing, but in but intentionally because it sounded like fuck off. Um, and Ai Weiwei is a personal hero. Genius. So, on the subject of t shirts, somewhere in my closet, I do have a never t shirt. If anybody remembers the parody of Steve Jobs' is Next, it's a little cube with N E V R that. on it. <laughs> Love that. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, that was a fun tour. Uh, I'm just connecting a couple of things that we just went through to my brain. Um, and I'll just connect it to the whole notion of taglines. So, dearly beloved, oh, Web3 is going great. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's actually super useful. Uh, we're sort of here, we're sort of here uh, with two purposes in mind. Uh, one of them is what Stacy uh, brought into the conversation a moment ago, uh, which is just we'd like to pay more attention to process and uh, think about how things land uh, and make, we tend to run, I tend to run these meetings at a relatively brisk clip, meaning we bruise on by things sometimes, uh, we don't slow things down, uh, we're having interesting conversations about what weaving is and maybe going back over episodes and slowing things down to, to then weave context but we haven't done much of that. So we're still kind of usually proceeding at our bumpy, bumpy pace down the, the country road. Um, and then the second um, framing for this call <clears throat> is that we've had several really interesting conversations that are clearly the start of the trail. They're, they're clearly the, the beginning of something interesting and important that shouldn't just be a longer conversation with lots of episodes, but rather we should get involved in some of the doing and we should get involved in um, uh, getting together um, hey, Grace, uh, we should get involved in uh, more activity and we should organize ourselves a bit better and continue improving our self-organization over time uh, in ways that are perceivable and useful to non-OGMers, to anybody who wasn't in these conversations. I think that's <clears throat> one of our goals is to feed the generative commons, to be creating materials and community conversations and spaces and artifacts and so forth uh, that are useful to the world. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, in the invite, I pointed out some of those conversations, some of the, the, the different threads that, that we've got going. Uh, one of them comes out of Grace leading us into money and value uh, two weeks ago. Woohoo, we can't hear you, you're muted. <laughs> money value that's right thank you um and another one comes from our metaverse and then betterverse conversation and where that's heading uh another one showed up in a pop-up call yesterday which was lovely we went two hours and six minutes i think or eight minutes uh, something like that but we um starting in a conversation about hey is america headed into another civil war uh, Rob and others were sort of like poking us to, hey, like, why don't we actually do what we claim to do more and uh, do more sense making? And so I, I poorly coined the term sense doing uh, on the idea that uh, maybe that's an activity that we can engage in. Uh, and so partly I'm interested in opening up a conversation here. Um, a piece of this, maybe maybe this is a two-part conversation. One part is, what's a nice way for us to organize these different threads and at what pace do we want to talk about them and where and how and what? Because the Thursday calls are now on this alternating format schedule. We just had one pop-up call. Uh, that's okay, but it, we're not going to get things done necessarily that way. It's fine if we have different paths run by different people going off in different directions, as long as they feed back uh, to the middle. And then the other part of the conversation is more this ongoing thing about, okay, good. Do we put things in massive wiki? Do we put things into factor? Do we put things in, like, do we put things in all of the above and then interweave them, right? Uh, so if there, if there are ways we can create dense nodes of, of rich information in whatever the more appropriate tool is, that's really pretty cool. Um, so heading that way. Uh, Pete, thanks for putting the link to the, to the Mattermost um, in the chat. So let me pause and see who has reactions one way or the other or offers for um, uh, a way to guide us through that path or whatever else. And I seldom see you all this untalkative. That's very strange. Oh, uh, where's the invite? Uh, the invite last night from me about this OGM call. And I, uh, it just, it's a couple sentences that I'm more or less repeated here. Uh, in my intro, which is uh, there was the grace uh, grace led call on money and value. There's the betterverse call. There's the um, how do we make sense of the world call that sprang out of the new civil war discussion. And then we've we've had other other sorts of things. All of these are really really rich. There's there's also this broader conversation about that Jordan put on the table about what does the meta project look like that wraps up all these projects together. Um, and, and he's proposing also something that isn't just, maybe this is a three-pronged uh, conversation, um, but he's proposing not just how do we share information and create the generative commons, but how do we actually run this as a, as a project? How do we create project planning and, and go to that level of detail? And I don't know who in the group is excited about that or who would like that uh, or what else. Um, I have, a, this is a reminder that we have a pop-up call in an hour and a half. Um, from yesterday, but maybe I need to log into Google Groups to see the newer topics because my update is probably behind the newer stuff. Which call from yesterday? Wait, what what pop up call in an hour and a half here? Uh, ten o'clock yesterday. Uh, ten o'clock yesterday was when the pop up call was correct. I thought you were saying that there was a new pop up call coming in an hour and a half from now, and I was like, "Ooh, I am uninformed." No, no, no. This is this is a so I'm trying to find the invite so that I might um, see these invites somehow. Oh, uh, I, I put it on the OGM list. Are you on the OGM list? Uh, the Open Global Mind Google Groups. Correct. Here it is. Our Thursday OGM call sense doing. That's it. I just don't get updates. I, I think I get them once a day. So. Are you set on the Daily Digest? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. So it hasn't come in yet, but here I am on Google Groups. Okay, great, great. super. So uh, I do have. I, I, mm. You need a Swiss so, Army knife. Just a couple of reactions. One is, I do feel this is a very supportive group for the things I'm doing. Um, 
and that I've met cool people and I'm sort of on this path towards um, you know, fundraising for this new monetary system that I'm working on. And I'll talk a little bit about, about what I see about sense doing. But, uh, my second reaction is I'm a little bit allergic to the, the sense making kind of conversation because sense doing makes more sense to me. One of the things that I have found to be concerning during these times of the pandemic and maybe a little bit before that is a disembodiment, but particularly the lockdown has increased the disembodiment. And so if we're talking about global health measures and looking at what actually works on the ground, I think people aren't looking on the ground. We've been taught to look into our computer and see what's happening. And, you know, like rather than looking around us and sensing, and feeling and doing experiments and actually trying stuff. You know, I have this, a lot of people come to me talking to me about like DAOs and you know, how great DAOs are gonna be and da, 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 da. But there's no sense making in looking at the actual DAOs and what they did, you know, and how it actually runs and how those experiments have been running for three years and be like, well, maybe there's an arrogance if I'm gonna do it differently, I don't know. but. To me, it feels that this, and, and, I, and I help organizations with their tokenomics in the crypto space. And I hear people speaking nonsense, but they can speak nonsense and convince each other of nonsense and raise a lot of money on nonsense because there isn't a, a felt sense of what's actually happening. And so this idea of sense doing speaks to me. Like I want to be able to touch it not just think about it and talk about it. I wanna to touch it and see what happens, which is really where I'm working. And that's why I'm in Spain today. I'm working, I'm, I'm trying to get some cooperatives and other movements on board with what I'm doing. And the people who are the most excited about what I'm doing are um, cooperatives and eco villages who've tried all the things that sound good on paper, but they know that they don't work. And now I'm telling them, okay, I've got a totally different thing. They're like, okay, that also sounds good on paper, but it doesn't sound like everything everybody else has you know, done. And even just starting with, um, you know, starting with, you know, this community currency thing isn't gonna work with you. They're like, we wanna talk to you because they know already because they felt it on their bodies. So anyway, sounds doing. Or they tried it out. quite confused and I would like to understand more. Um, a relationship is something that is exceedingly non-tangible. Um, for example, I've never uh, been on a walk with Gilfriend or, or, or possibly met him in person. Uh, but I have a sense of him from these calls and pretty much nowhere else. And possibly, you know, from some of his writings on the Mattermost or Open Global Mind um, uh, mail list. And in a sense, there is a sense that comes from interaction. And I certainly understand, you know, I, I have an allergy to um, the, uh, how do you say, um, what did you mention? The cryptocurrency, the, uh, the DAOs the DAOs, it, it doesn't, I, I concur with you, Grace, in the sense that it's, it's not touchable. Um, I've certainly been in rooms with many DAO participants in the uh, um, D-Web meetups um, in person here in San Francisco before the uh, global pandemic. And still, I just don't get a sense of, okay, how are we having an agreement? And is the only thing that matters in the agreement a sense of monetary value? I, I'm, I'm, it, it's a confusing thing for me, um, but I'm not exactly sure what you're saying in terms of mm, what you want in terms of tangibility. Certainly, Grace, you and I have not walked along the beach you know, pointed at the same thing together, shared eye contact, um, and 
don't know. Um, it's possible that you might say, hey, I know that Mark Carranza writes code um, uh, if he can't avoid it. And um, he can uh, uh, possibly help me with something and let's make an agreement to do something together in the world of coding or um, mm, uh, even that, uh, you know, setting up a DAL. It's, it's not beyond my capabilities. It's just something I've never found the interest in doing. Um, can you expand more about what you want in terms of this sense? So this is actually a pretty good example. And I would say, you know, I can also hold both things at once. But here's a perfect, this is a perfect example. It's a whole bunch of people talking about incentivization in DAOs, right? Like we're an incentivized people with funny money and completely ignoring the facts on the ground that that's not what motivates people. I mean, Facebook's not paying you anything, right? And, and so like this absolute ignorance of, but that's not what's motivating people. So stop saying incentive when you mean I'm gonna give people little tokens. Just say, I'm gonna give people little tokens and I hope that'll make them do things. Coerce, you could just say coerce or whatever. Incentive is, wow, it's really cool being, I mean, I make this call every week. I don't have time, but I have time for this call every week. So that's what I mean by this, like knowing what incentive actually is. So Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I want to point out that we're we're sliding into one of the conversations that's important that I was pointing to, um, and I, and and I'd love to. I think it's an important conversation enough that I'd like to slide out of it a little bit into the meta conversation about how do we organize ourselves into dealing with issues like this and others really well, because this whole notion. Um, my shorthand for this is what are the next two stacks, and I'm borrowing software stacks like the LAMP stack from the world of software. And I think that there's a societal stack and an organizational stack. And today the societal stack seems to be democracy with voting and courts and the media and you know the, the, the usual sort of program and neoliberal something or other uh, has won that race for, for now. And most liberal democracies are becoming illiberal democracies. We're kind of on that path. And then the organizational stack is C-Corps and uh, nonprofits and a few other sorts of things and some some exotic little other creatures that are like the little tiny first mammals underfoot and a uh, hundred years from now there may not be two stacks there, this may be intertwingled I don't know the nation states may not matter as much as they do I don't know but there's a there's active live really interesting and sometimes very stupid experimentation going on which includes this world of DAOs where it's like, hey, we can just simplify everything to smart contracts and, and incentive systems. And look, there's a dashboard, pick a task and earn some currency in our token. And like, woohoo, we're off and running and we're gonna solve civilization. That's a really interesting conversation to have because somewhere over the next hundred years, a couple of these are going to win and they may not be the better ones that win because typically over life history, shitty mental models, shitty scripts, uh, shitty political uh, structures win and then people get like screwed for, for a couple of hundred years in different ways, whether it's colonialism or what have you, right? The, the, the Treaty of Tordesillas, the, I've forgotten which Pope, <clears throat> but he basically says, hey, explorers for Spain and Portugal, when you hit uh, new people in new countries, if they don't know the name of Jesus Christ, they are your vassals and everything they own is yours. And you are uh, permitted by the church, blessed by the church to take them in the name of the queen or king or whatever. That's the Treaty of Tordesillas. That's a mental model. That's a legal framework to go do, wreak havoc on the world. That caused a whole bunch of stuff that we're trying to hit undo on today, right? And, and so I think, I think part of the conversation about, hey, DAO, Schmau, NFT, whatever else, or some other, for, or holacracy, sociocracy, hierarchy, lowerarchy, uh, uh, duocracy, and, and I collect all these, right? Um, Part of that conversation is is like what are we going to hopefully want to live under for a couple hundred years and le like leave leave to our progeny so that things so that the ship is steering toward better instead of steering toward worse which takes me back to the better verse right because for me a better verse is a place where we do that and enact those things and then sort through these models and, and all those kinds of things um so if, if you'll permit me to bump, bump our conversation up again a little bit to the, to the meta level about how to structure us and our conversations to tackle these things in a productive way together, and, and not just us, but there's a whole bunch of groups around the world trying to sort these things out. We, we are 
far from unique. There's lots of people bumping their head on this all around the world. Uh, the game B people, the, and I collect, I have a, actually, I'll, let me just, uh, uh, ba -ba. I have a thought called um, communities fix, communities trying to fix world problems. And I, I've got uh, us, uh, Open Future Coalition, Global Unity, Helena, Holochain, One Project, Society 2045, the Production Board, the Global Solutions Initiative, Earthshot Prize, Game B, Al Shark Forum, Common Action Forum, Common Future, Dent, Economic Space Agency, uh, Humanity 2050. Uh, so so there, there, there's a bunch, right? And, and one thing I don't know how to do that I'm really interested in doing is being kind of not a unifying force in terms of there should be one ring to rule them all, but a crystallizing force of some sort. And if we create a good generative common space that doesn't say there must be one opinion to rule them all, but rather here's how opinions meet and have sex and mingle and become better, um, I think that's a good world. Uh, do you don't mean the Chinese Communist Party, do you, Gil? Or yeah, I, I do. Tongue slightly in cheek, but not entirely. Oh, okay. And they certainly are trying that, but I'm 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 talking about well-intentioned groups that are not trying to like invade our privacy and do other sorts of things. But I, I, I agree your ironic opinion about the CCP. I, I, well, tongue slightly in cheek, because I mean, people, don't, people in the West don't know the Chinese Communist Party has had ecological civilization as a constitutional plank for like 10 years. Nobody in the West is even close to that. And for all the hypocrisy and power domination and da, 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 of what they do, there's something stunning there. Uh, and I just noticed that your, your list didn't include um, political formations. I uh, was trying to uh, use earnest communities. It says communities trying to fix. I have other thoughts about the political battles, which are, which are not connected currently to that thought, which, which I'm like, I, I need to do that. You're totally right. Yeah, I, let, let's, let's just, you and I have an offline conversation about what the definitional boundaries or something might be. There's a richness that's being missed and I appreciate the concern of what you're trying to focus on. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, put the, Put, put traditional political parties in there, uh, but there are you know grassrootsy radical um, um, organizations of many kinds that might want to fit in there. Mm -hmm. And the bridge between the ones you've got and the ones that I'm hinting at might be a very fruitful thing to look at. Maybe. Love that, Gil. Yeah, please, uh, Stacy. To just bring it back to the doing for a minute, one one problem that I think we should try to solve for is. How do we integrate some of what's happening in the chat to the main conversation? And I don't mean like the off topic stuff, but the stuff that actually pertains to what's happening in the call. Because if we could figure out to do that, that's actually a small way of starting to do what I think I hear people wanting to do. Um, so there's a couple answers to that. One answer is as much as I can during the call, I'm watching all the stuff in the chat, like the, the, the utility knives that Pete just put up there and a couple other sorts of things. And I go to those tabs in my browser and I, I curate all those things into my brain, which seems to be like a roach motel for information, um, unfortunately, because, because it's not useful enough. It's not externalized enough in easy ways for other people to use. But but I'm busy sort of harvesting and curating everything I see in the chat and the things we mentioned in the conversation and so forth. And I'm putting those out openly insofar as that's even useful. Anybody else doing that, I try to find. If anybody else says, hey, I did that too, I add their notes to, the, to, to my links to the call and I send them a link to my brain or something like that so that we can begin the weaving across, but we're not doing much. Pete and also Bentley created tools to take Zoom chats. Uh, Pete's is called Buzzsaw. Is that right? Uh, there's Zoom Chatter and Link Chainsaw. Link Chainsaw. I was so close. It was, felt like something that you cut things with, but um, that basically will will you input a Zoom chat and it outputs the links that were mentioned. Just boop, clean links, which is really nice. It's a handy utility. So in our quest to automate making these calls more useful, more interesting, that would be one step among many to say, okay, good. And here are all the links that were mentioned during the call. And we can put that someplace. Right now, that might be a page on the Open Global Mind website for each of the calls or something like that. But we're not, I'm not, I'm not actually building out a page on uh, a separate page on the website for each call because uh, we don't have that automation in place. But those are two ways. And, and I think that what you're saying is right. And I'm interested in anybody else's thoughts on that as well. Uh, Klaus and then John. Yeah, if I, if I may take a turn on this because I'm really struggling with, with this. Uh, 
uh, definition, a distributed autonomous organization actually originated with the military, right? Because they, they developed small combat groups um, of around eight to 10 people who are you now very powerfully equipped with rocket launchers and a phone to call in artillery strikes. I mean, they have amazing firepower. And the reason why they are autonomous is because there is always the risk of being disconnected from the base, you know, in the middle of a battle. So they have a mission and they, they are self-organizing and, uh, and they operate in a, in a very autonomous manner. Um, the, the thing, of course, is that they have a mission which comes from a central group. So they, they are being told to go to a certain place and defend whatever installation or engage in, in whatever form. So, so this idea, um, like, like many organizational concepts coming out of the military, is highly effective, right? Because um, you don't need to micromanage things that you couldn't micromanage in the first place from a central space. So you have trained people who, who are engaging in an autonomous uh, fashion. So in some way, we're trying to do that you know, with, with uh, a, a ton of NGOs and, and, and nonprofit groups engaging in regenerative agriculture, in energy systems and in innovations and so on. But there is still what's missing here. So you have all these autonomous groups engaging and working, but there's no central mission that is clearly defined enough, you know, for, for these groups to engage towards a common purpose that achieves a collective outcome that has to come from many sources, right? It's just like in the Ukraine right now, that's what they're doing. They're putting in these autonomous distributed teams, but they're all working towards a common outcome, right? Which is defense. So, so that, that's, we are, I see a lot of people running all over the place, you know, doing great things, wanting to do great things, but uh, lacking the coordination to achieve a common outcome. So, I, and, and I have no idea how, how you would break through this. And, and I do think one of the questions at hand is how unified or how common does our mission or goal need to be? And that's a, that's a conversation, that's a really good question for the conversations I'm trying to help us structure. Um, John, then Gil. Good morning. Hey, John. Very interesting, as usual, and very difficult, as often the case. Very, very abstract conversation. We like to gnaw on the thorny bone somehow. <laughs> we so. really do. We really do. So this is a trick. This is a perceptual trick that I'm feeling that, that to, uh, as another way to look at this. And I'm going to suggest you, we think about it as a minute as you miss this conversation. You want to see what happened and you want to see it in this kind of multi-dimensional way in which we're talking about. So that makes this conversation in time a trunk. And there's a place you can go. And, and, and I think this has to, in my mind, this has to be graphic. This is what I'd like from Santa Claus. I'd like to be able to go to a page with variable resolution Zoom in out, zoom out. I see, oh, there's the timeline. There's some text, you know, key, keyword, keyword, keyword. Off the, off the side, spinning off the text, maybe there's just the, you know, the Jerry's brain link, but there's also the kind of uh, network mapping link or the kind of uh, graphics display that, you know, a graphic facilitator might generate from the conversation, if it exists. And, uh, you know, there's, there's the potential... There's the uh, potential project list, you know, <laughs> and you know, there's these little things that are coming off their branches coming off the main timeline. And there's an indicator at, on the branches. So, okay, okay, yes, I can, I can review what happened and I can see all the spins and all the, the network and all the places where this is going, in, including uh, the great apps, which people like Peter are developing, which, you know, but the point is it's all in one place. I can, I can get to anything from that one page and there are indications on that page, uh, incomplete task or, or, you know, good thing to do, you know, so, so like, like you could pick it up here and you could complete this map and that, 
you know, if, if you felt so inclined, that might be appreciated. So that, that would also be on the map. Something to, something to do here to, to finish this part. Also on the map would be, you know, potential actions, potential projects, and links. So now I'm looking at this thing, and I say, wow, wow, you know, I, I get a sense of the whole day, I get a sense of the conversation, I get a sense of things that weren't obvious in the conversation, because they needed more reflectivity and more time to get cranked. And I also see lots of ways, I see stuff that's unfinished, you know, it, 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 there should be, instead of now when you go to a site and it's like, well, you know, we didn't quite make it. Well, you know, it's, well, it's under construction. So instead of that, it would be, look, this is how far we got. This is where it's trying to go. Pick it up or not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like an open, it's like, it goes as far as it goes. It tells you where it's trying to go next. You can help or you can not. You can say, well, well that, I'm not, I don't care enough. Or, or that one's not, that one's not growing. That branch isn't growing. That's okay. It's okay. You know, we, we're going to do lots of that stuff. That stuff. Anyhow, it's just, a, it's a vision of the product. And then you back up from the product and then you say, well, what would be the processes that would it would take to, to create a product like that? Thank you. Um, John, I, I, I personally love what you just described. And uh, when you started with variable resolution, I was like, yeah. Um, cause, cause depending on how close or distant you are from a topic, you know, nothing, you're a newbie, you need a different kind of resolution from, Hey, you you've been part of this conversation. You just need to catch up and, 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 you know, those are different kinds of notes. And, and by the by things like GPT three and other kinds of like text processing, uh, technology are getting extremely good. So some of this summarization doesn't have to be human powered, could be automated. Um, just that, that, but that's just a side note. And I think a piece of what we're interested in is how to make effective use of different kinds of technology. Um, one small side note, uh, Giri Lajos among us uh, is a big fan of Hypothesis, which is an open source project uh, run by a friend, which I don't use partly because it doesn't, it doesn't cohabit well with the brain. But if we pick one or several platforms like maybe Factor or Hypothesis or other sorts of things like that as meeting points, and then all of us start, and this is why hashtags are really interesting, right? Is that, is that within each medium, hashtags make hashtags in a searchable medium are a unifying force that, that you know, allow things to come together. Not at the level of granularity of a conversation around a page or an event like you just described, John, but maybe more generally around topics. So I need to know what's been said about DAOs in DAOs for nonprofits, you know, in the last week. And hashtags will help you get to a, like a mass of things, but they won't help you pick through the mass. So I, I think there's a, a bunch of things like that that we need to to avail ourselves of. Uh, and we had uh, Gil and then Pete, and then Grace. Thanks, uh, John. Thank you for that. I like that too, Jerry. I like the variable zoom, the helicopter, you know, helicopter, different levels of detail. That kind of fluidity is something that I thrive in how my body works in the world. So yeah, let's 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 have somebody do that. Um, I want to pick up on what Klaus was saying. I guess in the thread about you know, you know how focused does the mission need to be is a really good question. But um, um, there's another. Uh, let me back up. There's another angle from the military analogy class that you used. I had the occasion about a dozen years ago to spend some time with the U.S. Army general, first and only time of my life I did that, and it blew my mind absolutely, because here was a guy who I thought was at the pinnacle of a command and control organization, where you tell people what to do. No, not at all that. Um, uh, he described the example he described was imagine a platoon out on patrol and there's 20 guys they're wearing packs they're carrying weapons and the, and the lieutenant at the head of the platoon steps on a landmine and dies. Okay. Any one of those other 19 people has to be able to step forward into leadership and have both the competence and the respect of the other people to be able to lead. Not, not, just, like, not just like the next in line, but any of them needs to be able to do that. And so it's a kind of situational leadership that really struck me as, and startled me as the antithesis of command and control something like the decentralized autonomous that we're talking about. Now translate that out of a military war killing, you know, uh, metaphor frame into the kind of frames that we're talking about. And how does that inform the conversation that we're trying to have? So I think there's something juicy there. Uh, other example was the, uh, which I'll, I'll put in the chat in a moment, was the Gossamer Albatross project, um, pedal powered aircraft to fly across the English Channel somewhat 20 some odd years ago, Jerry, you probably have that in the brain somewhere. 
Uh, and their operational management system was very much also a decentralized thing. There was a list of what needed to be done. It was posted on the door of the factory every morning. People would come in and say, oh, I want to do number one. I want to do number 15. And people would self-choose what to do, mark it off when done, and then take the next thing. So there was a coordination function that said, here's what has to happen today. And here are the dependencies. And within that, people did what they did and worked it out among themselves. So. Um, I think this is rich in very important territory and comes back to Grace's challenge about incentivization. <clears throat> this part of the bullshit of modern management is that people do stuff because you pay them to do stuff. Thanks, Gil. Um, 1979 is Gossamer Albatross. Yeah. Uh, and I, before going to, to Pete and Grace, I just want to do a little excursion into military structure and history because it's come up several times now. And I posted a link earlier. I didn't check whether the link was still alive about command push versus reconnaissance pull, which I learned about from Kenneth Tyler, who is in an OGM uh, in the community, uh, who knows a lot about military history. And uh, basically uh, command push is what we think armies work like. It's like there's a central command, they make plans, those plans go down to divisions, go down you know, all the way through the core to, to like squads. And then somebody says, open the plan, go execute on the plan. And the plan has like detail. It turns out that good armies don't do that. Good armies do something like reconnaissance pull, which is you send small, well-equipped autonomous groups that have good high communication capacities back in, into, into headquarters, into some communication system, and you have them poke. And sometimes when you poke at the enemy, it's a trap because they've made things look weak and you fall into a trap. But sometimes you poke and you break through and then they say, hey, we've broken through mass forces here and, and push, and that tends to work a lot. But these units are extremely flexible and really intelligent. And, and Hitler did not create, but inherited one of the smartest armies ever created. So the Wehrmacht after World War I is this like really brilliant military machine that uses reconnaissance pull and blitzkrieg and a whole bunch of other sorts of things. And not like, there were plenty of problems inside, but, but, but they were a, a really odd duck among armies in the world. The, and, and the American military at the start of World War II is as stupid as a rock and as, and as top down and hierarchical and you will get, you will get court marshaled for missing the, the, the command structures and all that kind of stuff. Americans are completely ill-equipped for the war structurally. And they're going up against this insanely flexible, intelligent, like the German army was hiring the smartest people out of schools and bringing them into, uh, you know, bringing them in. So, uh, so metaphorically, there's lots of interesting leaps over into how do you equip groups. Um, one of my mentors was Russ Akoff. One of the things he did for Volvo was set up teams of, I think it was 21 people who would assemble a car. And those 21 people were an autonomous work group that was in charge of hiring, firing, reviewing, uh, planning, scheduling. Uh, basically, they were like a little wee company and all of their IDs were tagged to the parts of the, of the car that they made. Each car they built had the, the, the service records of that car would be tied to their, I think, long-term comp, but I'm not sure. And that wasn't really the, this, this wasn't like a compensation design system, but it was an autonomous work team. And these people had lots of pride of work, lots of other sorts of things. And it's the opposite of what we think the assembly line degenerated into, which it did, which was all I do is I lift this one part, put it in the stamper, let it stamp, hope my hands don't get caught in the stamper, pull it back out, put it on the finish stack. And, and when you see repetitive work and you see how many people on earth are doing repetitive work, your heart hurts. Um, sorry for the long digression, but I, but I, was, I, I wanted to say that that autonomy and de decentralization are, are good and noble goals. They've had lots of roles through history in lots of different places. And they're, they're like, sometimes systems are not what we think they are, like armies. Um, Pete, then Grace, and hopefully you wrote down some notes and uh, remember what you were gonna say. Um, thanks, Jay. Um, uh, we could talk about so much stuff. It's really cool. Um, uh, real quick, a couple, a couple things I wasn't going to talk about, but have to. Um, uh, Gil, you should dig up the call from yesterday, the recording from the call from yesterday, and there's about 30 or 60 seconds of Jack Park talking about um, hanging out with uh, Paul McCready and and crew, um, which it's a you know I it's like. Oh my gosh, I was sitting in the room when Jack's like, oh yeah, I popped by the, you know, the airport and we were chatting about stuff. Uh, we had, a, it's interesting that you bring up Gaussian Albatross because we had um, uh, a, a fair bit of conversation about it yesterday and, and uh, Mr. Allen, the bicyclist who was the pilot, 
um, and the uh, the uh, anyway uh, O2 Max or whatever VO Max. Um, uh, I also wanted to in in the background. I guess this was also Gil. Gil and I ended up talking real quick about rug pulls. Um, this this is a, a beautiful. I I, I have a, a little bit of I, I I like to see. Sometimes it's nice to see nice to see really interesting parasites. Um, uh, parasitic things that happen in ecosystems are are to me a a measure of the maturity of ecosystems. So like email spam is a scourge on the earth. And I wish all the people who invented email spam, you know, would have stick to their knitting and not bothered us with that. But at the other, other in the other way, um, when we started having email spam, I'm like, oh my God, everybody is starting to use email and it's and it's big enough that you, you know, that people care to spam it. There was a time when when not everybody used email. I don't know if you remember, but I do. Um, uh, anyway, uh, an, an amazing parasitic thing is happening in um, in decentralized finance and crypto and stuff like that. And it's called a rug pull. Um, uh, you get nowadays you get these investment opportunities investment um, or gambling opportunities as we might think of them um, in, in more normal uh, conversation um, uh, what it says is oh yay um, you can make uh, 10x your money uh, overnight um, all you have to do is put some of the funny money uh, put an equal amount of funny money and uh, real money real crypto money in in a pool uh, and within a week you're going to have uh, fabulous wealth um, I, I say this as somebody who is actually making money on the non-fake ones of these. But anyway, there's a bunch of fake ones you have to watch out for. So what happens is this gets announced. It goes out on, on the Twitters and the, and the whatevers, uh, the Reddits, and a and, and, uh, bunch of people swarm into essentially what is a Roach Motel. Um, and then uh, they, you know, 18 hours later, 24 hours later, 36 hours later, the rug is pulled out from underneath. And people take the, the the people who set up the Roach Motel take the the real crypto, they throw away the junk crypto, they take the real crypto and they abscond with it. So that's a thing that's happening regularly nowadays, um, uh, to the tune of you know hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions of dollars, just like that. Um, it's really interesting to see it happen and and scary as heck and um, makes me reminds me that we're really in the wild west frontier with this crypto stuff. But um, it's it's a uh, guilty pleasure, joy to see that amazing uh, that amount of amazing uh, parasitism um, on our on our world. Um, even though it's sad for the people who lost their money. Um, uh, John, the real time mapping thing is really cool. We're actually not that far away from that. I think. I mean, in in one way, we are. It's going to take tons of technology development to do that, but we are doing the the components of that already. Um, so that happens. Uh, with me and Jerry, me and Wendy Elford uh, uh, in the Flotilla Group, uh, me and Wendy uh, McLean and uh, Michael Grossman and Vincent Tarina, um, we're all working on ways to uh, the the verb that Jerry and I use is crav uh, crav a call, um, take the you know take the metadata of a call and the juicy bits of of information in a call, turn that into something that's a little bit more persistent. Um, and then we were the, that collection of folks and others are working on dashboards and things like that. So, you know, in, in two years, we could actually be doing that in real time. Thank you for elucidating that vision and making it um, that it's, it's not something it's it, you, you made it more coherent than we've had uh, discussion of, uh, you know, in, in six months or whatever. So um, uh, we'll come back to that description and, and blow it out into a, a product requirements document. Um, or whatever the uh, agile um, equivalent of that is, or non-agile, the, the construction equivalent of it, if we're, we're in the uh, Lionsburg realm. The thing I wanted to talk about, um, thanks for listening to me, and I'm sorry to take up time. Um, Jerry said, and I do think one of the questions at hand is how unified or common does our mission or goal need to be? And I think this is a really interesting question, and I've been puzzling this one for a long time. Um, uh, and the the answer to me, which the the answer to me, which is not really obvious, but I think it's really important to think about and get right, is that it's I I feel like, and I've kind of been working on over the course of my tenure with OGM, um, small um, 
uh, small, very focused groups of people working on a, a thing that they think is super important and that they can pour a lot of energy and time and effort into. Um, the, a, a classic example is uh, Collective Sense Commons, which more or less is it's a tiny organization. It's me and a few uh, other people doing stewarding. Um, uh, Collective Sense Commons mostly exists to run Mattermost for OGM and other groups. Um, so that's how focused Collective Sense Commons is, right? It's doing one little thing and it does it reasonably well. It doesn't do it perfectly. Um, so it doesn't care about, um, you know, it doesn't care about any of the content stuff, um, uh, soil health or uh, carbon offsets or any of that stuff. It doesn't care about any content. Um, it does care a lot about the quality of the system running. And that's the thing that it cares about most. So that's a, a really concentrated and, and easy to explain example of something that, you know, it's, it's a way, the, and, and then the opposite of it is the way that we ran the OGM forum. OGM forum is kind of run the same way as, as Mattermost, um, but uh, OGM forum is owned and operated by OGM, um, mostly me and again, some stewards. And uh, we ended up in this weird bind where OGM as a group, collectively doesn't really want to manage the, the bits and bobs and bolts of, of managing an infrastructure thing like the OGM forum. Um, so we ended up in this bind where we couldn't make decisions very well. Um, and uh, the, the whole thing kind of like blobbed out and, and didn't get used be, for the simple fact that there wasn't a good shepherd of it. OGM, no offense folks, uh, OGM wasn't a good shepherd of the uh, OGM forum. Um, and so it, it spun out of, uh, you know, spun out of um, sustainability, basically. Um, CSC Mattermost is, is opposite of that. It's, it's more or less a success story, just because I think it, was it has management focus around a thing. Um, so to come back to how unified or how common does our mission or goal need to be, I think I, it's, it's really tempting to you know, decide what is most important to me. Um, most things that are important to me are that people aren't mean to animals and that um, we don't all die of asphyxiation and that my grandkids and great grandkids have a place to live and, and millions of people didn't die in, in wars or famines or, or of drought or whatever, right? Those, those are the things that are important to me. And we can kind of, we could all kind of go around and kind of make a, 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 a big collaborative set of the things that are most important to all of us. Maybe we could have dot voting or a DAO or whatever, right? We could decide what's most important for everybody. Um, I think that's the wrong approach um, because at some point uh, it's like, well, you know, there's a platform in here that I don't really care about. I don't even know why I would care about it. It doesn't mean a lot to my family. I, I actually, I guess I understand why it means a lot, you know, uh, an indigenous population is oppressed by um, uh, by co colonists. So that's something I I you know can't really relate to much because I'm one of the colonists um, or descendants of them at least. But I can also kind of in the abstract go well that that would suck. I would totally hate to be in that situation, and I want to pledge some you know support into that. I want to be an ally and do whatever I should to help those people. At the same time, that that is me splitting up my attention, me not doing a good job of taking care of what I think is I, I know is super important, and then um, and then kind of sub optimizing my support of uh, another important goal. Right. So I'm not saying that I shouldn't support those folks. I think I should do a lot of that. I think I should give them whatever the help they need. But what I think should happen is that I should help them do a good job at their needs rather than trying to join their needs. I'm not explaining this very well. I haven't, haven't thought that through very well. But anyway, um, so I think you want, you want to join up with a small, passionate band of folks who want to change the world. And you want to be really, really highly invested in whatever that is, right? soil regeneration or monetary policy or uh, indigenous rights to uh, indigenous um, uh, um, uh, agency, you know, agency over, over my, you know, my, my birthrights or whatever, right? 
Um, you want to be really passionate about that. You want to join with other people who can be really passionate with you. You want to look for people who are really passionate about infrastructure, right? Um, I, I wish there was somebody who ran a chat server so that we could all chat, you know, and it's like, oh, well, actually there's CSC, they run a chat server. Thank God, I don't have to think about chat servers. I can just use the CSC one, right? Um, or the same thing with monetary policy. I wanna know somebody who's taking care of monetary policy and um, I want to essentially be a customer of theirs rather than trying to figure out how to do it myself, right? So, so then, what I've described is kind of this fractured landscape of everybody is in these little groups caring about certain things, um, not the whole space. Um, uh, they're caring about certain things. So then into that space, what you need is a way for these groups to uh, talk amongst each other, right? Um, how, by the way, what do you use for chat systems? By the way, what, you know, uh, we're bumping into the fact that we need to exchange our community currency into fiat. What systems do you use for that? You know, who are the, who's the little village that cares a lot about that, and who can we go talk to about that? Um, uh, so we need good coordination mechanisms. We need good flocking. You know, uh, the uh, tools and and processes to help us flock, help us decide, help us um, make um, um, agreements. Uh, bilateral and multilateral agreements between these little villages that are each working on their own thing. And we don't have a lot of that stuff. Um, we're, we're inventing it as we go. We can also borrow some, there's things that we have from businesses uh, and startups, start plan and stuff like that, like MOUs and, and compensation uh, structures for startups and things like that, that we might be able to adapt into our little uh, flotilla of all these decentralized little groups. Another thing that that we might want to do, again, going back to Jerry's question, how unified or how common does our mission or goal need to be? I think um, what, what we want is for each of those people to be publishing, to be able to publish in some way. Here's what we think is really important. Here's, you know, and, and I'm going to take on the persona of an indigenous person. I'm going to do this really poorly. I apologize. I'm an indigenous person. Uh, you know, land was grabbed away from my great grandfather and grandfather, and we've been left to to starve and and have poor health care and not have the water we need. And and they they put you know my my all my relatives are living on crap land because the white people stole the the good land, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what's important about that. Here are the things that are important, you know, in my life. When I look out and I see, um. I, I want to keep going with this, but I, I'm going to turn into a parody of an indigenous person. I don't want to do that. So, um, so I, let me let me come back to me. The the things that are important to me that I know about that I can describe very carefully and and clearly and succinctly, that needs to get published up into some global catalog of here's the the various needs, right? And here's kind of a catalog or a marketplace or, um, uh, so that so that we don't end up with a common set of goals, but um, lots of, I, it, but we end up with uh, what our society would call a marketplace of ideas, a marketplace of goals and missions and things like that, so that you can go inspect them, talk about them, uh, be inspired by them, be horrified by them, um, and, and help guide your little ship in the flotilla towards the thing that you know are most important and flock with the other ships moving towards the things that you're most important and away from the the other goals i think i i think it's it's easy to go well everybody's gonna have a wonderful and, and laudatory goals um uh uh i actually guess i guess i hope in a weird um backwards way uh, upside down way um you actually want lots of goals in there and some of them are going to be anti-goals for most people probably and and you know uh that's that's going to be something um uh that uh kind of just the way i started off with uh, rug pulls i guess um the the sign of a mature ecosystem is that you've got a variety of stuff and and some of the stuff is bad and you have to have uh, start evolving ways to protect yourself from the bad stuff so I'm sure there are, there are people 
well, we know, I think we, the, the folks here, our tribe knows that there are folks who are trying to steal democracy or what, however we would describe it. Those people should be publishing their ideas and goals and, and, and um, where they're going into that, into that space too. And, um, and I guess we don't suppress that stuff. Uh, we learn how to uh, work around it, how to select things that are good in general for everybody and not, not, not bad. Um, anyway, long story, uh, long story short, um, let's not have, so unified and common is, is probably actually kind of an anti, I, I, I guess that's, that's the thing. It's a, an anti, anti goal for me. Um, shared and distributed and decentralized and discussed um, and vetted and things like that are, are things that I want to look for. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. That was a lot of things, but nicely put. Thank you. Um, Grace. Yeah. So um, ha of... happy you have your cat back. I don't have my cat back and I do need to make some phone oh, calls to see if shoot. I can do it. Like somebody found my cat, but I am 2000 miles away. So that's a little bit of a problem. Oh, so, that's right. You're in, you're in Barcelona and your cat is back home. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Totally <laughs> missed that part. Yeah. It totally can be inconvenient, but I'm going to try and talk to my landlady and see what we can do. Um, I mean, it means she's still in the neighborhood and she'll come back even if I'm not that. Anyway, Pete said a lot of what I wanted to say, um, both in terms of the mission and in terms of how to think about these things. I want to just add one piece to marketplace and the way we're thinking about it and these ways that we're thinking about mapping and matching and all these things. And one of the things that we, we're not saying out loud, but we know we do is we, we, we say, um, oh, I know who you should meet. I know who she should meet. Oh, uh, oh, uh, there's this thing. There's this thing you should read. And we send it to each other. And it's like, there's this huge processing going on and somehow that happens. And it's invisible, right? So that's kind of like, there's a, there's a respiratory system or a circulatory system there. And we're ignoring it in some ways. Now, Amazon, speaking of marketplaces, Pete, is not ignoring it. And so this matching that we're talking about and this people should publish it and be a marketplace. I think that we're talking about a kind of a circulatory system that's almost invisible to us in some ways. It's like, I'm, you know, Amazon advertises something to me. I'm like, that's exactly the kind I would like. How did they know, right? Or, you know, like the filter bubble. And it needs to be, it needs, I think marketplace is a good word for that. I think it's the right word. It's just, especially if you think about it in terms of the AI that you would put behind it. And I feel like all of these um, sense-making groups and whatever we're trying to do this mapping or matching or whatever. And what we're up against is pretty sophisticated AI. And, and then if you can create these infrastructures, like I'm working in the world of money and commerce as an infrastructure issue. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not right, or for governance or for whatever it is. I'm, I'm not really exactly sure. I think this is a good place to talk about that. To me, the, uh, like, again, I'm I, like, my body looks like this, and it can only, like, I don't have wheels. I want wheels, right? But I can't because I have a certain f infrastructure here, right? My bones and my circulatory system and my respiratory system and my nervous system. And so to me, one of the why I ended up talking about money was because it, I know it's one of them. Right? I know that is one of the things that we don't think about that holds us together as humanity. You know, art and language are also ones which are kind of, I don't know that we have that much agency to change, you know, the way in which we speak, but we certainly have visual things. But when you start to change the infrastructures, it's like, it is the thing that is creating the boundaries. And so that's what I'm thinking about this marketplace. Like how do you define the AI that puts these people together in a way that is productive and not destructive? Like what is the, you know, the skeletal system? And mm -hmm. so that's, that's my big inquiry. Like what are those elements and how do we do them? And you don't need a great big team and you don't need everybody on board because it's, it's invisible to 90, 
99% of people. Um, By the way, that's why I have hope with DAOs because they're the wrong tool, but it's the right way of thinking. It's like, how do we make this thing underneath that nobody really cares or knows about? Agreed. Um, thanks, Grace. I want to, everybody who's been jumping in a lot so far, step back for a second. And anybody who would like the floor, uh, raise your hand like Richard just did, catch my eye, whatever it is. Richard, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm, <clears throat> this is only my second call here, so I uh, will take the great leap of... Uh, so I, I will tell you just, I'll try to make this coherent and brief, but um, my world uh, in my professional life revolved around taking eight ounce jars of soil and doing things with them and then conglomerating them together and making decisions. I'm not sure those decisions were great, but they, they were there nonetheless. And um, actually uh, sort of leading off of what Grace was saying, um, but I would say that a small, and, and Pete as well, small is better, you know, dedication to a cause is more important than the number of people that you attract and things like that. But I've uh, thought a lot about, I was a map maker, or I am a map maker. And so symbology was so important to me. And uh, originally when I made maps um, or PowerPoint presentations, I used every transition in the whole toolkit. Ah. Like, oh, this is cool. And uh, I would take it and do the presentation. And afterwards, as we were walking out of the room, I'd hear people say, man, that was a great presentation. Somebody else would say, what was it about? And the other person would say, I don't know, but man, it looked great. And so as I moved into maps, the same um, thing happened. I would take a map and put it up on the wall and the bosses would look at it and go, wow, there's the edge of the plume. There's the edge of the hazardous waste plume. And they would put their finger up on the map and point to it. So eventually I started using um, color ramps and I would fade things away so that there was no point to put the finger on. And then ultimately I went to grayscale because uh, people in different cultures, you know, perceive color uh, differently and its meaning and all that. But it really, really uh, clued me into the idea that the words that we use every day, these are just maps, of course, they're maps of uh, of what we're thinking. So I have gotten into the mode of thinking about the invisible circumstances. And the way that I envision this is that the entropy between a brick and a house. And that's kind of my, my example that I've come up with recently, but meaning that we can, you know, you can pretty much identify a brick. You, you know what it is, it stays fairly stable, but that brick could move into many different, um, avenues, you know, grow to a house and things like that. I'm going to look at my notes real quick and make sure that I'm, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, so the point is, is that as groups are built, um, I think that uh, one of the measures of a, of an organization of any kind, of any kind of flock would be the entropy that's contained in that flock. And so organizations, flocks that are very chaotic, you know, such as we see right now in, you know, in our United States, at least, um, those are very difficult to pull into to, into any kind of reasonable uh, forward path. And Jack Park and I have spent a lot of time talking about trust. And yesterday I said something and Jack, you know, came back to me and said, well, what do you mean? So uh, what I said was, is that uh, my interest is in building trust sufficient to accomplish a goal, not in building trust. I, I don't, trust is never going to be there. And I will close by saying that, oh, one of my, I will have to say that one of my superpowers is that I'm not a good coder. I don't have a lot of degrees. I've lived in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Southeast all my life. I have no outside view of the world, et cetera. And that's one of my great strengths because um, it lets me not be deflected by uh, other things that are going on. And so what I was saying that Jack and I were talking about, um, about trust. And uh, I think that the trick might be like a lot of us are saying is to start small. But the deal is, is that let's say that we have four or five groups working on things that they're all interested in. Um, is it appropriate to, 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 to uh, banner those under OGM? In other words, once they go out, when the military goes out with their small groups, they have a certain, um, shall we say, legal parameter <laughs> for why they behave the way they do, whereas we don't necessarily have that. But I'll also, one last closing, uh, 
at the Gossamer Project, the list is great. And I always like to say that uh, who cleans the toilets? And uh, I will close with the, uh, the story of the fellow who was at the back of the circus shoveling um, elephant shit in the bin. And somebody walks by and says, man, that, that's terrible. Don't you want to get a new job? And the guy said, what, give up show business? So it, 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 our view of what we're doing really matters. Like Stephen Breyer said yesterday, I'm not going to quote it right, but he said, never ask a chicken her opinion of the fried chicken dish. And so what we perceive as doing really, really good and great things and all that, that's not always true. And in fact, it, it really is true. And I'll, I'll even offer one as a prediction that I kind of feel like we're going to have to get down to about 5 billion people again. I, it, it just seems like we're at a point where the gases, the particles are reacting so, so rapidly that we can't control it anymore. And so part of the deal is, you know, that indigenous people probably just want to live like they did before the bulldozers came through. And how we return to that, I don't really know, or if we should or otherwise. But anyway, that's my long ramble about entropy. And I think looking at systems via their energy and their entropy levels it makes them more transparent, makes them more transparent to what, what we're trying to achieve. The end. Um, Richard, thank you. Um, two tiny thoughts. We, we seem to be, except for Africa and Latin America, we seem to be depopulating. Like there's plenty of countries in, in Europe and Japan and a few others where, with negative population growth. They're not, you know, 2.1 children per family is, I guess, uh, zero population growth is like, like stasis. And we are well below that in lots and lots of countries, except for a few continents that are exploding. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in terms of the larger conversations that we're having about why are people worried that we might go down to 5 billion people? Does that mean we, does that mean we automatically cataclysmically go to zero? I don't think so. Uh, I've no, I've no, we wouldn't have to do genocide to do that. It would just be a whole bunch of people not reproducing as much, which is like not a terrible thing in my head anyway. And then separately to go back to what you pointed to about small projects and to go back to Pete and also my work with Pete. My best description of these little projects is tiles in a mosaic. And to, to, to nudge that toward what we were talking about, about uh, sort of how unified do our visions need to be, I'm really interested in, in different people in different groups painting a mosaic, an impressionist picture of what their vision is, of where they think they want to go. And then the tiles in the mosaic, if you can find a triple word score tile, meaning this tile will solve a problem for my mosaic and then OFC's mosaic and then game B's mo Let's fund that tile and let's make sure it gets designed so that it fulfills the needs of those three different groups. And then let's publicize it so that it's useful everywhere as an open source component. But these little tiles can have whatever name they want, what, you know, a, a crew that's passionate about doing that, that piece. And I don't know if I, that seems to maybe sort of work on some scale, but I'm not sure. Uh, I may be describing how open source software kind of works, but I don't think I am yet. Uh, and then I mentioned in the chat earlier that Unix really is just a big grab bag of utilities that happen to work well together. And you chain utilities together to get something done. How, why don't we have social systems that are, that are more like that? Uh, Stacy, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I just want to bring up the idea of trust and how much is necessary to do a job, you know, to do a job and some of the things that were said about what's happening in the invisible. So for example, I had been part of a conversational community and it used all the right language about love and consciousness, but the leader of that particular group was, did in the way it was viewed, did not treat women fairly. So when I saw these women getting thrown out and I also noticed that the men who secretly agreed or it, not in the presence, you know, agreed that this is horrible, they didn't step forward. So between those two things, that group was non-starter for me because no matter how wonderful their work would be, it's always gonna be tainted by that invisible thing that you can't put your finger on. And eventually it's gonna fall apart. Thank you. Um, anyone else who hasn't stepped in yet like to step in? Cool. And back to back to anybody who'd like to pick up where we are. I threw a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, yeah, you did. 
you know, when I, <clears throat> I've been studying conversation and what we, how what we do in conversation gets work done for a long time now. And I noticed that um, we keep circling around in sense making and, and we have several conversations going on simultaneously. Like, what is sense making? What are we going to do with it? What can we do with it? Well, you know, how are we going to apply it? Um, and I think it might be really useful to slow it down and, and have a conversation dedicated to what is it? What can we, we're not going to agree on everything, but what can we agree on? And, and then, you know, what are the practices that really allow us to apply sense making in very useful and ways um, when we're confronted with really complex situations? And I think it's been touched on numerous times. The mapping is critical because it is so complex, we can't hold it in our heads. And we need some way of constructing a public map. And I don't know if that's, Miro has potential for that, but I think one of the problems with Miro is that the first time I saw Miro, I was, there were eight other people on it and there's all these things moving and I'm trying to listen to somebody, you know, tell me about this. And so we really need like a baseline of, okay, if you're interested in Miro, let's walk through how to use it. And maybe we have several people doing their own mirror boards and they come together and put their mirror boards together. So you're assigned to listening for the emotional content. You're assigned for listening to next steps. You're assigned to listening for whatever. And I think we need to play an experiment and find our way into how do we create these maps? Because that feels to me to be a really critical part. Without the map, I keep hearing things that I sort of hang in my, in my head somewhere and I don't have Jerry's brain. So I'm not quite sure how they interrelate and, and getting that visualized it might take a few months to do, but I, that to me feels like it's a very high um, uh, value proposition for us to explore. Thank you, Ken. Uh, point really well made. Uh, Michael, Pete, Doug. Um, I just posted something in the chat and actually relating to, to what Ken just said, um, you know, the, the, the ability, I mean, what I put in the chat for those who aren't looking at it was just that the idea of this marketplace or library or commons of ideas is obviously great. And we all want it, you know, OGM to make the thing that that is, or, you know, this one or that one, but, you know, Grace has a Miro, you know, allergy and, uh, and, you know, they're, they're all different, all different ways of looking at this stuff. And if, if all the things that we produce, if all the knowledge that we produce that we're willing to share with others on all these different platforms and out of all these different calls um, could be looked at with the tools that you choose to look at, you know, I mean, the, the, the things about you know, we, we all use different email clients and have different devices. And there are certain standards that allow an email or a text or an image to be looked at in through, through different lenses, in different platforms, in different software. And, you know, to go to the library and say, I wanna see which of the calls, which of the, the items brought up in this OGM call are in Grace's Airtable that she's willing to share or that are in any Airtable of somebody that's willing to share or are on Pinterest or are uh, in a Google Doc that um, includes sharing from Jerry, you know, this, this is the fact that we're not able to recombine, I, I said this better when I was writing, I'm not articulate enough to, to get it across, but the idea that there's all this stuff that we're generating and one-off emailing it to somebody else because they should see it, as opposed to putting it in the commons, you know, maybe with a tag, to say with a with an app mention to say hey you should look at this but i don't want only you to be able to see this or maybe you know i want only these 10 people to be able to see this so i'm not putting it all the way in the commons but i'm making it commonly available and you can see it whether you happen to use airtable or miro or or whatever that kind of interoperability seems 
seems graspable and seems like, you know, we can't be proprietary enough to say, oh, Factor's going to be the one to do that. Trove's going to be the one to do that, you know, and I, I, I just pushing toward these standards of interoperability, and I use that word till everybody's sick of hearing it, um, seems to me what our mission, um, you know, our first mission needs to be. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I totally agree. Um, Pete? Um, thanks. I, I uh, thank you, Ken, for bringing up Miro. Um, Miro is Miro's a decent tool. I, I'm allergic to it too, um, like, like some of the rest of us. Um, the, so I, I, think, I think where it goes, Mir, it, it's tempting to say, why don't we make a tool that's easy enough for everybody to use? And, and so yay for Miro doing that. They kind of ended up in a bind and maybe Grace and I are, are talking about that a little bit in chat. I, I'm not sure that that's the right thing to do. Um, I think a, a better model is, is to have um, uh, people who are really skilled with a tool, a, a good tool, people who are really skilled with it. And then what they can do with that tool is shareable with people who don't use the tool and with people who are using other tools. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fault to, and not that, not that I would have seen this either, but it's kind of a fault for Miro to say, let's, let's democratize, you know, democratize this so that anybody can go in and use Miro. And it's like, so the good things about that are uh, multiplayer is really important. Um, we've got Jerry stuck in the brain and uh, he's, he doesn't have a multiplayer tool. So he's doing amazing stuff, but he can only do it by himself. So Miro got it right that, that a tool is better if it's multiplayer. Um, uh, the brain got, also got it wrong, kind of, it's hard to get stuff out of the brain. It's, it's not pleasant. Um, Miro makes it reasonably easy to get stuff out of, out of um, itself. It's got a decent API with a big caveat that um, depending on how you structure the information inside Miro, maybe I can get it out and, and make it into an Airtable or a massive wiki or a factor. And maybe I can't because if you made the information like graphically important, but not structurally semantically important, it's junk basically. Um, uh, so, so anyway, I think uh, maybe, maybe a, I, I'm not quite sure what I'm saying here, but I've got there's there's a thing about um, it's it's really tempting to want everybody to use the tool, but that's kind of the wrong approach. You want people to be really good at tools, and you want the tools to be really good, and you want to be able to have the tools share out information to people who aren't using the tool, um, and then you want the the stuff to be able to go from tool to tool, tool from virtuoso to virtuoso on along in tools. So if you kind of think about that, that's kind of the way um, uh, music works. Um, so think of a, an ensemble or something like that, a piano ensemble. There's a, a guitar and a bass and and uh, drums and and somebody uh, doing stuff on piano. Each of those people can probably, like most of them, can probably you know pick up their seat and move over and sit on, on another tool. Um, so the guitar player can probably play, kind of plink around stuff on piano. The bassist can probably play the drums. But when you really want to play good music, the the bassist picks up the bass, the drummer picks up the drums, the pianist picks up the piano, and they rock out, right? So. Um, people end up being good at different tools. The pianist, you wouldn't expect a virtuoso pianist to also be a virtuoso drummer, even though there are some, you know, uh, off the scale people who are. Um, so what you do with that is you make music together, you interoperate with the piano player can interoperate with the drum player and the, and the drum player, she can interoperate with the bassist. Um, but they're not, they're it, 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 it's not the case that you say everybody should be able to do everything or we should pick one tool and, and do that, right? So in a way, and I'm making a really crude comparison here and I apologize to the Miro people. Um, I love you anyway. <laughs> um, it's, it's Miro is, I, maybe it's something like kind of saying, okay, well, a piano, let's, let's use, you know, let's center on one tool. Piano can make lots of sounds. Um, I can hit it, the top of it or I can think around on it 
or a virtuoso can sit down on it and play a, 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 an amazing concert. Piano is good enough. Let's just use a piano. That's the only tool that we'll use, right, to make music. And let's sit everybody around the piano. And regardless of their skill level, skill level or their virtuosity or their physiology that lets them play a piano or the or drums well. Sorry, drummer, you got to play on the piano. You've got to figure out how to make sound on the piano, right? That's kind of where we ended up with Miro. It's it's like one tool that fits all. I'm not sure is the best way it works. Very much. And, and, and I think a, a bunch of us are like trying to figure out how do these different tools actually interoperate? What does that even mean? There's been, you know, we've done lots of digging on that front. Um, oh, pretty... and interoperability because of our culture, because of our, our freaking capitalist culture, interoperability also includes property rights, which is the weirdest damn thing to say, right? But um, uh, when you make stuff in Massive Wiki or you make stuff in Factor or you make stuff in Airtable or if you make stuff in Miro, unless you affirm it in our culture, in our legal system, unless you affirmatively say, please take this and use it however you want, legally, it's locked up, it's owned by somebody and you can't use it. And it seems like such a simple, stupid thing, but I have run across this as a, you know, as a, as a, as a instrument player, as a virtuoso at certain instruments, I run across all the time and each of us does, you know, it's like, Oh wow, look at this trove of information. I could repurpose this into a beautiful massive wiki and turn it into a wonderful website, except that nobody gave me the permission to do so. So legally, I cannot do that. Like I can take little snippets of it or I could point into parts of it or something like that. I can play this game. I'm not even going to bother. So we really have to, you know, the, somewhere pointing towards the generative commons or whatever. Um, interoperability, interoperable data also includes freaking property rights. Um, and brief riff on this, on what Pete just said, does everybody know why we have Mickey Mouse to thank for this? So the Copyright Term Extension Act is otherwise known as the, the Mickey Mouse Act because Disney keeps trying to keep the mouse from falling into the public domain. So every 20 years, they extend copyright for another 20 years and denude the public domain. And I and my first job in the world was at Disneyland in Anaheim. And I'm like, I hate you guys. You guys are stupid, evil. Stop it. How could somebody who does Bambi, oh wait, that's a cruel movie. Um, we watched Cruella last night for no good reason. And why would you make a whole movie about cruel people? Like really, and it's not good to not watch Cruella. Watch Encanto instead. Um, Julian, Mark, Michael, and then we're gonna wrap the call because we're at our 90 minutes. Uh, that's the thing is I just came from eight to nine. I was at a seminar about progression of RDF triples stores versus labeled property graphs was really, really encouraged by it. And it's quite seriously applicable to the discussion that's been going on. So the comments I had to make aren't gonna fit in a minute. Um, do you wanna take a swing or just pass and bring it back? Or do you wanna write something on the lists? Uh, I, I would love to hear more about, uh, about that. I mean, it's, also it's a good topic for Free Jury's Brain on Monday. Uh, yeah, actually it is. Cause it's a little geeky. Okay. So warning to everybody who's on the call Monday is I'll, I'll be ranting again. Sounds great. Uh, Mr. Carranza. Yeah, um, uh, Julian, that sounds amazing. If you can uh, uh, share a, a link if possible to that uh, sooner rather than later, that would be fantastic. Uh, they promised to send the slides out. So uh, let me wait for that, so. All righty. Um, Listening to this conversation, um, especially about the notion of training, um, I think there are, gosh, some ur documents that um, everyone should read, um, which is training. Um, Turing's uh, nineteen what thirty five paper um, in mind on. Uh, you know, intelligence, um, I posted a uh, uh, document from Doug Engelbart on augmenting human intellect and uh, his notion of HLAMT. Um, where is that again? Humans using language, artifacts, methodology in which um, sick he is trained. Um, and it's a really simple, clear kind of notion about um, his goal 
of how basically we as people can augment each other's intelligence, um, either through technology or, you know, training or, you know, basically what we can do together. Um, and I'll just basically suggest that um, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm was thrilled to uh, hear that uh, this group I'm part of um, taking a course in basically some philosophers, some Catholic philosophers, they said, we don't want to deal with the cruft of academia. We just want to get people together and learn. And that kind of statement, um, you know, where people can kind of like self-organize and learning communities feels like a statement of what we're doing here. We're definitely not going through you know, UC Irvine social ecology program, even though, hey, that might be a... I should have totally signed up for that. Had I walked across campus and knocked on their door, my life would have been completely different. <laughs> in instead, I learned econometrics under Charlie Lave. Like, like social ecology was right over there. Right, right over there, exactly. Heard, heard about them, never inquired within. Stupidest move. Could have saved myself 40 years. I, if I had uh, taken... Uh... Uh, cognitive science instead of architecture. Well, you know, we we grow up and uh, we learn what we what we do. Anyway, I'm on to Michael. I was actually just going to lower my hand because I, I have to jump uh, to another meeting. I think. Uh, well, I, okay. Do you want to take a swing at it? Uh, no, I'll, I'll 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 cede the floor. It was it was not important. All right, thank you. Um, this has been generative. I, I appreciate everybody's heartful conversation and generative contributions. I appreciate everybody's patience because we don't have the answers in our hands yet after struggling with this for a long time. I believe we make baby steps of progress here and there. Uh, and I'm really interested in making larger leaps of progress, like extremely interested. Um, so anybody with good ideas about how to do that, that'd be great. Um, Grace, part of what I was hoping we would talk about in this conversation and we never really sort of got to, but I was trying to brush us back toward was, um, from the, from the conversation you started about money, uh, it feels like there's sort of two conversations there possibly, and maybe more, I mean, there's it's kind of myriad conversations, but there's two that, that we might be able to formulate, one of which centers around you and your projects inside of that sphere and how we might be helpful and anybody who'd like to help you and like, like really sort of helping create a platform that, that helps you do that. And then the other one is the outer envelope of the topic itself and how it fits into governance structures and and, 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 and that, one, that one can sort of be more wide ranging and, and, and connect into all, all, all sorts of broader things. But if we only hold that one, I don't think we're helpful enough to you. Um, and so let's think about that maybe. And if you wanted to host a series of calls under the umbrella of OGM, if you felt like it and just say, hey, anybody, I'm gonna have office hours on Tuesdays at this time or whatever uh, and see who shows up and record them and put them back in the bin kind of thing as we're doing, that would be cool, but that may not be your, 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 your taste on this. But I'm, I'm interested in how do we organize to help you more concretely? Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm kind of dragging out a little bit because I am physically in Spain right now doing research for that. And it's going to take me about another week and a half to have sort of a hopefully five minute, five to 10 minute presentation that really explains what I'm up to. Sweet. Um, and then I also just started the workshop where I do a six week program going through these topics with people. But at the end of that, I'd love to lead a series within the OGM community or whatever host maybe not even lead, but just kind of create a space in which we talk about these things. So sounds yes, awesome. to both, and I'm very glad we didn't get to it on this call because I, yeah, I need a few more weeks. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Mark, if you want to post a list of your canon of the OR documents to any of the channels on Mattermost or the OGM list, I will, I will make that a thought and connect it up because I've got most of those documents. I just don't have them necessarily connected that way. So I, the OR list would be really cool. I just wanted to say, it's good to see you, Michael. 
it's really good to see you um and uh certainly ken and uh grace and julian stacy jerry and uh, uh of course richard uh please come please come again come back yeah. um thank you all anybody with the last uh, thought okay then let's be careful out there <laughs> anybody else remember hill street blues oh yeah okay pizza man Ha, ha, ha.